there. Um, she was one of the founders of the Merck program, and she also was the chair of the Southern Group of Educational Affairs, one of the founding board members of the Association for Standardized Patient Educators, and was president of the Society of Directors of Research and Medical Education. She is a master's in clinical psychology. Her PhD is in epidemiology and community health. Um, and her research interests include faculty uh, development, curriculum innovation, program evaluation, and standardized patients. She's going to talk today about operationalizing the competencies. Thank you. And hello, and thank you all for joining me today. And I appreciate it. I'm going to use this opportunity to get some feedback as well as to frame this uh, talk about competencies and EPAs. I'm going to make some assumptions. I'm assuming that everybody in this room has extensive knowledge about competencies and has heard about that for years. How many of you are familiar with the EPA concept, the entrustable professional activity? Okay, a couple of you. And I'm, I'm not surprised. That is the more nuanced and new idea that I want to explore. Specifically, I would like to talk about the challenges of competency-based education because that's part of the reason why EPAs are being utilized now. It's yet another attempt to try and operationalize the competencies and come up with a structure for assessment. I will get a little bit into the literature that there is on EPAs and talk to you about the attributes there. I was just talking to Erica. I think it has applicability. How many of you are in residency training primarily? and undergraduate. I think, my personal opinion, no data here, I think that at this point in time it has relevance more for residency training than undergraduate, but at the end I'm going to talk about a project that I'm working on that is actually a continuum project, and we're trying to incorporate the EPAs into that continuum. So finally I want to focus this just on assessment, because that seems to be the biggest challenge that we have. As with anything, I want to start with definitions. And the reason I want to start with the definitions is they can help ground why we are trying to think about this entrustable professional activity. When we think about competency-based education, we're supposed to be focusing on outcomes. We're supposed to be focusing on how we're going to address all those competencies. A competency, I would argue, is a personal attribute. It's something that we can observe it's usually fairly specific, but it has to talk about progressive development, and that's a key point that I want to make later. When we talk about competence in Epstein's language, it's the habitual use of something. It's not just being, you don't get competence by doing something once and being assured that you're competent once. It has to happen over time. And it has to have an outcome that it benefits an individual or the community. So we're trying to do competency-based education. How many here are doing competency-based education in their programs? How many have tried to do competency-based education? I mean, most of us are trying. That's what we're being mandated to do. It's exceedingly challenging. And if you look at the literature, you talk to your colleagues, I'm not sure anybody has got this down. Because you need all of this. You need outcomes. You need milestones. You need that progression. You need to know, you have to have things that are observable. You have to have criterion for your outcomes. You have to have a standard that you all agree upon. You have to align yourself with the needs of diverse learners at diverse stages of their progression which is also a challenge in our time-based framework. And as I said, we're, we're a competency-based means you be are process-based, not time-based. And that's not the way our structures are set up. We have four years of undergraduate and multiple years of PGL1, two, three fellowships. It's time-based as our organizing principle. Sorry, I have to move back and forth here. Um, so when you think about that, there are multiple challenges when we try to do assessment. Our assessments are almost always time-based. They're a point in time. Usually it's a different assessor depending on what point in time that is. Uh, we can't do the competencies writ large unless they become concrete. So a general competency, medical knowledge, is very difficult to assess as a competency. We 
don't typically associate those competencies with a specific patient outcome or even a learner outcome sometimes. And we don't have criteria. We have not done a good job of looking at criteria for progression. And if you go back to the definition of competence, it's about the habitual use. So there has to be some progression. So what do we do? We break the competencies into activities, specific activities. How many of you use a checklist-driven kind of approach to whatever you're doing, either for procedures or our interviews or anything? There's usually points in time and you use a checklist. Again, the assessment center at one point in time we are using, I think, because of the ability to do that and uh, the expertise of people, we're using a lot more simulations now, both patient-based simulations and computer-based simulations to help us with our assessment and our teaching. But these are not work-placed assessments. And I think we would all argue that sometimes just because they can do it in a simulation does not necessarily mean it would translate to the work environment <coughs> with its complexities and its challenges. And everything is one size fits all, typically. We don't do individualized assessment. We certainly don't do individualized training tracks. So why do we want to think about entrustable professional activities? I think the key for these is that the two words that I think are most important here are entrustable and professional. And I'll tell you why in a minute. We always break the competencies down into activities. That's been our natural. We take the competency and we break it down into things that we can measure and test. But the entrustable part, I was talking to a couple people beforehand, trust is something that sort of resonates with us. It resonates with our clinicians. It resonates with the trainees. You've trusted me to do something. It resonates with the public. So it has that face validity, if you will. You can, and I'll show you a table later, map EPAs to all the things that we've been trying to do over the last few years, the competencies, the subcompetencies, the activities that we're doing. But it adds this new dimension. It adds this judgment. It adds trust as an explicit part of the assessment. I think it's always been there. I know it's always been there. But we haven't made it as explicit. This is an example of an EPA. Any pediatricians in the room? <coughs> All right, yay. Um, caring for the well newborn. So we're looking at something that would occur, I would argue, in a residency program. They have to be able to care for a newborn. If you look at the specific characteristics underneath that, you will see knowledge, patient care, system-based practice and improvement, interprofessional skills and communication. They're all wrapped up into that one construct. But if I asked you about a given resident, can he or she care for the well newborn, you could probably tell me yes or no as a gestalt. I think that they can. I've seen them do it enough time. I trust them to do that without me supervising it. And in that, you might have all these things in your head that you're looking for or have looked for over time. So that's what an EPA does. It sort of rolls all of it up into a construct that is a professional life activity. Caring for the newborn is not something that um, our maintenance worker might do. This is something that we want our pediatricians or our family medicine practitioners to be able to do. It's grounded in the everyday work of the individual. These are sort of cross checks. If you've developed an EPA, does it meet these kinds of parameters? It leads to an outcome or an output. The complexity of it requires knowledge, skills, attitudes and perhaps multiple competencies. Ideally, and this is the work of Tenkati and Scheel, it, this concept started in the Netherlands in about 2005. And they have done a lot of work in a lot of different disciplines. And they're coming up, this is their suggestion, they're coming up with the idea that for any specialty, there could be about 50 to 100 of these EPAs, which is, I would argue, a manageable set of EPAs.
Remember I said the most important thing besides trust is professional? So this has to be essential to your professional work. I think that's the other criteria when you're coming up with an EPA. Is this something that is absolutely essential? Uh, it must lead to a recognized output. It has to be confined to qualified people. This is why you have to do the knowledge, skills, and attitudes training. This is not something that somebody just walking in without any kind of background can be doing. It should be independently executable. Now, this is one that I take issue with. I don't take issue with the definition, but we're being pushed and moved towards interprofessional training and teamwork. So if we're going to use this construct of EPAs, how is that going to be modified or expanded so that we can use it in that context if we're talking about an independent execution of a particular activity? Again, I think that's why I had a question mark in my title. I think we're moving towards something here, but I do not think that this is a panacea for everything that we want to try and do for competency-based education. Again, it would reflect more than one of the competencies. I apologize, you probably can't see that on your, on your handouts, and I don't know if you can read it on here, but this is an OBGYN EPA mapped to the competencies. So if you can't read it, the first line is the ability to provide adequate patient care. And we have in there care of uncomplicated pregnancies is our first column, a normal delivery, uncomplicated, I can't even read, neonate, high-risk, complicated, perioperative. So it's a series of EPAs that are critical in OB-GYN mapped to our ACGME competencies. What can you use this for? Thoughts about this? How would this be useful to you? Any ob -gins in here? How could you use a chart like this? You can't? Well, I think it speaks to the best method of teaching would be an apprenticeship. Ah, it is an apprenticeship in a way. And I'll talk about that in a minute. It is really about an apprenticeship model. But this is framing. This is giving you some structure to what you want, to, want the students to accomplish. You don't assess these, you assess these. And you infer then competence in the various competencies. But you're right, and I'll talk about that in a minute, because this, this model has been contrasted with the apprenticeship model. This is a different way in which to look at mapping that was done for a specific institution. Pediatrics is doing a national project to look at the milestones and the EPAs for pediatrics that they want to then disseminate across all programs. So in this model, the yellow would represent some sort of competency related to, subcompetency, related to one of the major seven competencies plus the EPA that it's represented by. The yellow would be national ones. The blue would represent ones that might be program specific. So in this case, professionalism was a particular push for a program. So they wanted to map an EPA with both the national subcompetencies and the programmatic subcompetencies. So the mapping itself could be a way to structure your training and it could be a way to structure your assessment for your program. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, can you go back to the slide before, just because it's less legible on the handout, and, and walk through? I was trying to, to get a OK, story. let's take this one. This is possession and ability to apply medical knowledge. So I, was thinking of, I was thinking of what, because the ones on the top are easy, because they, you can apply them across the EPAs. Correct. So I, I was wondering, for any of the ones um, the possession and ability to apply interprofessional communication skills. Why, why any one of the ACGME competencies wouldn't automatically apply across every EPA? In other words, why wouldn't every they box could. always be filled with a doc? They potentially could. The goal for your program and for your, you as the, the person who's looking at the student's performance is to identify which of those are the ones that are key that you want to focus on and to take this approach looking programmatically to how you're looking at the competencies. Because everything could be every. So in actual, I mean, in actual practice, you'd expect the competencies to apply across every EPA. But you say in your program for, for 
carrying out professional responsibilities is going to be the focus of that. This is going to be my focus. And that is why this type of a, of a chart can help you even be more specific, specific yeah. and discreet about saying, and we're even going to focus even more on professionalism for this EPA and for this EPA. I think this, is, this has been the challenge and this has been the problem. Everything fits in everything. And, and that is not a manageable structure for either our curriculum for our assessment or, in many cases, for our learner. You know, this way you can focus not only your assessment and your training, but you can also focus your remediation. And is there, sorry, I like that. No, it's, but this is, this is not. And on the flip side of that, is there not a risk? If you're not, if you look back at that table, if you're not focusing your learners on interprofessional communications, inter, interpersonal communication skills, in every one of those EPAs, and they feel like it's less important for the uncomplicated practice. You know what I mean? Are you, are you then teaching them to selectively that decide when to be? <laughs> <laughs> I think that is a. I think that is a risk. First of all, this this type of a structure is used more for looking holistically at your program and specifically at what you value. But to your point, I think this also occurs in the workplace. That is a key part of EPAs. You're not setting up a simulation. This is actual practice where that's going to occur. Whether that's an assessment point for you is a different question. It, it would come up in the, and that will get into the challenges. The challenges are giving people feedback, telling them what they did well, telling them, and it, you wouldn't bury that. You would just highlight that. And part of, the, part of the challenges I know from my world when I'm working with learners is they're getting too much information. They're getting everything for everything and they can't process all that. So this is a way to help you as the instructor and the assessor to titrate your need to tell them about everything. But you have to be very explicit to make sure all these dots, when you have 100 down here, all of these need to be filled in. And if you've only got two of these in one area, you, you need to say, look, this is important. I would argue, and this has not been said, but I would argue that each of these would have an equivalent number of, of highlighted dots. Or if your program is really, really want to stress um, professionalism, maybe everyone has that in there and you consistently look at that. This is a way to frame it. What happens now? There's no system to this. It's happening episodically and students and residents are getting that message implicit, explicitly and implicitly. I'm sorry, you had a question? Yeah, I, I sort of agree, I, I can definitely agree with David. And the, I don't know if we were different as learners, but it seems to me that, that today's learners are very concrete. If you, <laughs> if you don't say that every behavior is important in every situation, they pick and choose. You're, I think that's correct. And it, it seems more like it's, it's helpful in evaluation say, well, that this is a more of an evaluation grid. You say, I, it's easiest for me to make sure I understand they're doing this in the following EPAs as opposed to all of them, because well, it's too mammoth a challenge. I don't want to speak for the pediatric working group, because they've... Uh, I know, they've Carol Caraccio knows her business. I yes, know. I know. <laughs> no, no, but I'm, I was going to use that as a case in point. What this group has done is gotten a group of individuals together, pediatricians, looked at the literature and use that to try and help frame some of these prioritizations. One could agree or disagree with that, but I think your points are well taken and I totally agree with the concreteness, but what you're saying to all of the learners is, is all of this can be important, but this is what we're focusing on. It's a mapping challenge, I think, to some extent. Yeah, Erica. Right, and I would argue that you don't need to put it in every venue other than the message that you send, because the difference between the top two and the bottom ones are that there's specific knowledge and skills that are required for each of those EPAs. The other ones are uh, you know, communication skills. If you can communicate with the patient throughout their entire pregnancy, why are you going to measure it just at delivery? Don't you don't have to right, measure right. it at the same... David, the, the penultimate one there, the ability to Right. professional responsibilities. That's the one that David pointed out. That's yeah. just fairly universal. No. And yes, question. As a learner, <laughs> um, I, think, a <laughs> I think it's helpful as a learner to feel like you are focusing on one thing. And, you know, obviously I want to be professional at all times, but maybe 
maybe when I'm doing my pre-op care or whatever, it's important for me to, to talk to somebody else about that and to reflect on that for myself and take the time to do it at specific points rather than doing everything all the time because and it's about taking a sort of a system approach. I agree that people want concreteness, and that's, that has to be explicit. But it also is about the, this trust. This trust is ultimately a judgment. You know, you're using your collective wisdom and experience to make a judgment that I trust this person to do something independently, or I, trust this, I don't trust this person to do something independently. And again, think of this, say there's 100 for your specialty. You've looked at this resident over a hundred different instances. I don't think you're going to have a gap in any one of their skill sets, regardless of what you focus on here, because you are looking at this gestalt. I mean, I think that's what the EPA is trying to say is it isn't about discrete activities. It's about the integration of activities. But this is just, ultimately, we've got to get down to some sort of chart, some sort of map, some sort of thing that we can check off and I think this is the way in which they're starting to conceptualize this as a process for the training. Yes? So then is it called entrusted professional activities instead of just professional activities because you're saying to the trainee and student we are entrusting you to learn all the different competencies that are involved in this particular EPA but we're just going to focus on these two or three competencies. Right. Your responsibilities for all of them for evaluation purposes are one right. or two. And I think the real work is not so much with this, with the yellow and the blue, the blue being, it's what you decide within your program you feel is valuable and, and that you do trust that they're going to, in order to earn my trust, here's what you have to be able to do, is what we're saying to, this, to our, our trainees, which is happening now, it's just we're not being explicit about it. It also, the discussions have been interesting in groups that have been working on this because trying to come up with the 50, 100 things that you think are the most important in your discipline is quite a challenge. You know, the, intent, the tendency is to want to put down everything under the sun, but the reality is that may not be, one, achievable, nor is it valid. So I think those discussions and dialogues are very interesting. Other questions? Or, yeah. That point. It's interesting that originally, the original citation of 50 to 100 per specialty, when some specialties now, like internal medicine, has years out to comments, or and those are around 10. Yes. Yes. So I, there are no literature defining how many there should be. This is totally just an opinion by the people who've been working on this right now. Unless I think it's more. It's, it's, I think that's one, having worked now at three different institutions since the competencies have come in, the challenge is it's too complex. And we can't, we can't turn it into something that's meaningful for instructors or for the learners. And I think that's what it's all about. Is that, and this is just another frame. I, as I said, I, again, I don't see this as a panacea, but I see it as another way to frame it. But it has huge implications from a resource management issue. The other um, construct I wanted to bring up is the, the whole thing about milestones because we are looking at our learners over time. We are assuming they're going to increase their level of ability, we're going to increase their trust, we're going to increase our trust in that. So I think that that's the other thing that this project has been working on is how do we define milestones? How do we define somebody's gone to another level? And I think the best way to explain that is to give you an example. This is an example of one of the current pediatric milestones. I just find it curious, pediatric development. They went for milestones in development. I mean, their idea was, you know, the same kind of charts they use for the kids. It applies here. And so I think it was a natural blend. But this is the kind of thing. What I did was underline how I see their thinking progression here. Uh, this obviously would be the, the first milestone, if you will, and it's just knowing something. But by the time you get to the top milestone, you have to be able to analyze, evaluate, create, 
adapt, and it's a way to help you as the assessor to look at the scope of someone's abilities and say, they're consistently working at this level, or they're consistently working at that level. And remember, it has to be EPA specific. You may be very proficient in the care of the newborn. You may be not very, you may only be up here at a more sophisticated skill. So it's done by activity. Um, Carol sent me this just before I came because I said, how do you, how do you conceptualize? Carol Caraccio is one of the leads on this developmental pediatric project. She's also working at the, Ameri at the pediatric board now. And she said, it's just the way she does, sees it as pulling all this together. We start with the EPAs, or we have the EPAs as our big picture in the big view, but ultimately we're getting down to these milestones, these discrete elements where you can say this person's here, this person's here, and this person's here. So she said, try this out on the group and see if this helps them pull it together. So I'm asking for feedback. <laughs> she said, the, yes. That was what I thought. <laughs> big egg, and then the 50 to 100 EPAs are the smaller places at which you could reach a milestone for each one. It seems like it's the other way around. Well, like I said, she just sent this to me and said, try it out and see if this helps people conceptualize, because that's sort of what I thought, too. I thought we were, there should be little circles here and little circles there. So I'm going to see her next week. I was going to talk to her about this. And I would have put the, the domains on the left and the EPAs next to it. Okay. <laughs> But there are more of them, and the domains are the huge, you know, the competencies are the are huge buckets. Huge buckets. Right. Although it, I don't know that it's linear. Is it? That's the other this is a learning question. Is, is, is something like this necessary to help people to figure out how these things interrelate? Because the other thing she had was just a big circle and had all of these elements in a big circle and said they all go together. One of the other kicker is, is that I think the ACGME has signaled that the EPAs are so difficult to wrap their brain around that they're sort of shunting it to the side for the time being. Yeah, yeah. And it's just uh, like it's too... It's, too it's hard. It's hard. So, you know, we can't do that. Well, I don't want to spend they, too they much... Dropped, they've almost dropped the terms from the most recent communication. So what I want to focus on a little bit more is the entrustment aspect of this. So uh, when is competence attained? If it is a habitual act, it isn't a point in time. It's a continuous assessment, if you will. So we're asking ourselves multiple questions here. When are these professional activities man mastered? Uh, can they practice? Can we say to a trainee, you can practice this unsupervised? When is there this full entrustment that, you know, you're no longer needed, I no longer need to be anywhere near you and you are capable of independent practice? And how do we know that mastery is sustained and improved? Because I think competence is more of stages. It's, it's a continuum. And that leads me into some of the levels of entrustment. This is the levels of entrustment that were generated by the Netherlands for their postgraduate training. They assign these levels to their residents, one, two, three, four, and five. I'll let you take a minute and look at them, and then I want a reaction. We do basically exactly the same thing in surgery. Mm-hmm. At each level. Surgery probably has the most in common, I would argue, the because it's procedural and you can sign off, and there's already some regulations in place that make that. But do these make intuitive sense to others who aren't in the surgical discipline? They sort of relate? Okay. There's been some validation of some of this done by some qualitative work by Tara Kennedy. She looked at, they did a, quite an extensive study where they went into clinical settings in both the emergency room and in general internal medicine and looked at what was going on in terms of supervising. They did debriefings afterwards. They did interviews with them. And these were, from their qualitative analysis, the four areas of supervisory involvement that they came at. Obviously, the one that isn't in here is no supervising. But these were the 
these captured what they considered to be the types of supervisory involvement that people have. Does this make sense to people too? It makes sense, but in the ACGME world, there's no circumstance under which supervision cannot occur. Correct. Correct. And the goal here is not about supervision. The goal is about when are they finished with training. Because the other big issue, the other elephant in the room is, why is it taking so long? Why does training take so long? And it doesn't need to take that long for all of our learners. And I think, just anecdotally, people would say, hmm, maybe not. But we have no consistent way of assuring ourselves, the public, and ACGME that it can be done differently. And we need the warm bodies to take care of patients. And we need the warm bodies to take care of patients, yes. <laughs> um, these entrustment decisions are already happening, so this is nothing new. They're already happening in the clinical. They're based on direct observation, going back to your apprenticeship observation. That's what we've done. They're reached at different stages. They infer competence. They're not a direct measure, but they're typically only at one stage. We only do it at one point in time. Um, they often will grant the right to act independently but they don't equate to competence in multiple areas. So when you look at entrustment, there's lots going on. This is going to bring up your point that you just made. First of all, say we, say we choose to use EPAs. Not all, all EPAs are equal. Some are much more complex than others. Some occur at a much higher rate than others within a training program. So it makes it very difficult to assure that all of our trainees are going to have entrustment in all of these EPAs across all training sites. And this is particularly true, I think, even at the undergraduate level. It's very difficult to make sure that you can get everybody multiple observations on some of these EPAs. So the time that it takes for a trainee to, receive, to be assured that they can act independently might be due just to the prevalence of the EPA in the system. The working environment means there's got to be individuals like yourselves who are available to make these kinds of judgments and who can give feedback and help the learners to improve. The trainee has a big, big responsibility here. I mean, what if they're not motivated? What if they aren't very confident? What if they're not willing to take on that entrustment even though it's been given to them? And um, in addition, they should put time and resources up there, but the clinical teacher itself, do, is this a concept you even buy into? Do you have the skills to make these observations? So the time to entrustment is much more variable than we would like. So that said, somebody put together a chart about entrustment here. But it isn't going to apply to every single learner at every single time. To give you a little bit of ways to interpret this, a two on this chart, let me make sure I say it right, a two would mean that they still need a lot of supervision. They can't do this independently. A three means moderate supervision. Four would be independent practice. And five would be you're supervising others. So this was sort of a framework that was put together, again, for pediatrics to help them look at their program and help them decide where they think residents should be at what particular time. Now, because we have a time-based framework, you've got the PGY1, the PGY2, the PGY3, the PGY4 as your columns. What I think this could help us to do as a framing what if you collected data and 100% of your PGY1s were at a four here? That, pardon? Yeah, it, implies they can be moved to PGY2. it implies that. Now again, each EPA is going to be different and uh, the 100% of fives and all EPAs is probably not going to happen, but it might help us to gather the kind of information we need systematically to make sure that we are focusing our activities when we need to focus them and we're maybe moving people up quicker or 
maybe ACG would take something like this to say, you know, it's not time on task. It's their ability to do these things independently. Now, this has not been done yet. This is still in its formative stage. But the idea here is to look at it in a more explicit way in terms of independence and ability. My concern, this is an evaluation concern, is that once you achieve that independence, does it stay <coughs> sustainable? How do we know that they're still at five a year later? We're not always looking at that. And if we don't build that into the system, I don't think we've really improved practice here. Questions on that? Yes. Is there an, is there an inherent value judgment in terms of the way this is distributed, um, making the case that if you're doing a procedure, you need more s supervision because it's more sophisticated than if you're providing longitudinal primary care for chronically ill children, which I would, I would argue I can't imagine that the pediatrician in the room thinks that PGY-1 is at a three or four level, which is less, right? The number goes up and you require less supervision. Correct. Yeah. Five is you're supervising right. others. You might say, you know what, I, I can watch you do a lumbar puncture two or three times and you're done for the rest of your career. But taking care longitudinally of chronically ill children, you'll be 50 years old before you really figure that out. So I wonder if there's, in the way they distributed the numbers, um, a value judgment Yes. These procedures seem like they're more important and more sophisticated, and the primary care seeming like it's sort of, oh, no big deal. Just put your yeah. stethoscope on the chest and you're done. And how are you right. defining this? Any bozo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you supposed to say? I gave you a straight line. What are you talking about? Yeah. Again, all EPAs aren't equal. Some are more complex. There would be a definition under here, if you will, like we had with the <laughs> care of the newborn that would articulate some things they're looking at. So my statement back to you would be it depends on what they're looking at here you know in terms of what they say a person can do independently but have you had these kinds of dialogues within your department to say this is what we are looking at this is how we're calibrating I mean I think that's one of the values of this it gives you a framework to start those discussions whether you agree or disagree with this framework has really no relevance I mean we are by default assuming say you have a four-year program, everybody's at a five at the end of PGY-4. I mean, that's the default statement. Whether it's true or not, that's the default statement we're making. And I think this helps to make it a little bit more explicit about what we think and what we don't think. And what do we think? Maybe some things don't get put in here. Maybe this is not something that is achievable by the end of your residency training. The EPA should be related to that, not to everything possible that you can do. Um, so, it was brought up earlier, are we really just going back to the future? Is this not just the apprenticeship model? And we've just gone back to it. And yes and no would be my answer. Because what we are saying is the relationships are critical here. We've got to have someone who, uh, who is involved with our learner over time. We do want the assessments to be embedded in the actual workplace not just in a simulation. And um, there has to be that direct observation. But what I think hopefully we've progressed to do is to be a little bit more explicit about what it is that we want to be looking for as, as the person who is the apprentice for the, the student. And if we can, We've moved from, by having an EPA framework or any kind of framework, we've moved from random events to a more explicit choice of the things that we're going to be looking at, a more deliberate curriculum, if you will. And at least for the people who support the EPAs, they believe that you need all of this to make the whole. You need the competencies, you need milestones, you need the EPAs, you need assessment in order to do a good job at this. So at the end of this, I said, OK, what are some of the challenges? And I ran out of points on my <laughs> slide here. Because I mean, there's, there's so many that, like anything worthwhile doing, it's just hard. These are some that I came up with. You know, can we agree? I mean, those pediatric milestones, there's, I don't know how many people are involved in it. I gave you the URL. I, I want to say maybe. All of us believe that Carol is, knows what she's doing, and she'll figure it out. 
<laughs> but there's, there's, a, there's a group that's looking at this. And then they're putting it out for, for comment. And don't you know that they're never going to get consensus? It's very hard to do that. So do we do it locally? Do we do it within our programs and at least have something explicit within our programs? Can we support this? I'm at a brand new school, as Erica mentioned. And we're trying to set up things. And you know, ideally, I would love to do something more individualized. I can't figure out how to do that. And that's without any pre-existing structure, because so many things work against that individualized approach. Um, what about the validity of this assessment? Do we trust our colleagues to make these trusts? We are make, trusting our colleagues, but my guess is you trust some of them more than others in terms of their ability to judge the residents' abilities. Um, how do we look at the interplay of the individuals? I mentioned that I feel the EPAs have a particular limitation when it comes to interprofessional work and teamwork. So what about this interplay? How do we, I don't like to use the word train, I did use it, but I apologize. How do we develop faculty skills and assessment to make them keener observers and better evaluators? And how do we achieve this ongoing progression of assessments so that we can assure that this is occurring over time? And I'm sure there's others this time. I see our time zone and stuff. I just want to tell you about a project I'm working on now. Um, that's trying to look at some of this. It's called EPAC. It's the uh, education and pediatrics across the curriculum. There's five schools that are involved in this. We've gotten the support of um, a AAMC, the American Board of Pediatrics, and ACGME. And why do we need that? Because this affects accreditation issues and this affects licensure issues. So they're quote unquote on board with our pilot. These are the five schools that are participating. Maryland may start a little bit later. And what we're doing is we're going to, in year two of the curriculums, the undergraduate curriculum at these schools, we're going to identify s learners who want to go into peds. They say they want to go into pediatrics. They are going to end up being a cohort that we take out of the existing curriculum and develop curriculum and curriculum activities for them that are focused on child and child health. One of the hypotheses is, can you teach medicine from the focus of a child as opposed to an adult? They will still have to meet all the requirements of the school, but there will be <laughs> activities that are focused on pediatrics for them. And um, then they will go into residency <coughs> programs in one of these five schools that will continue the same training that we've done in the undergraduate. So it's be, we're looking at it as a continuum from first year through, gra through graduate school. We've gotten the blessing so far from ACGME to allow that, that in essence they will have a guaranteed spot in pediatrics if they meet all of our competencies. How are you going to get around the board today to match? That's what we're working on. But <laughs> I mean, that's why we started the dialogue with them to say if we can show you, because we're going to use the EPA framework, we're going to frame this in the EPAs and the milestones, we're going to have more documentation on these individuals than the others, and it's a small end. It's a very small end. So within the schools, we are reserving slots for a small number of students. And so far, they've said we can do that. So what we're doing now, we're going to have longitudinal continuity experiences, we're going to have specific people that are working with the learners. So you can, you can extrapolate and know what all our problems are. I mean, this is resource intensive. It hasn't been easy negotiating this within some of the schools. The five schools are doing, every, doing things a bit differently. But we will agree on the, on the framework of what we want them to have accomplished by the time they hit the PGY1 level. In analysis, we can look at whether they made this milestone faster or slower than what we anticipated. But this is taking an enormous amount of effort, an enormous amount of politics to get this done. So I see lots of challenges. What's appealing to me from an evaluation point of view is the opportunity to look differently at the way our learners are working. So what are the next steps? I do not have that answer. I just have that as a question. And I have five minutes to answer your questions. 